world is what four and a half billion years old and there's been life on it for a very long time we're only johnny come lately welcome to nature magic today i'm speaking to aina nilana a familiar voice on the radio and tv to people in ireland aina has a degree in botany and microbiology and an h dip in education from ucd She's a long-standing member of the panel of experts on RTE's wildlife programme, Mooney Goes Wild, and one of the most instantly recognisable voices on Irish radio. Originally from Louth, she now lives in Dublin and was president of Antoshka, the National Trust for Ireland. Aina is also the author of several popular wildlife books, Talking Wild, Wild and Wonderful, and Straight Talking Wild. This is quite a funny episode as Aina didn't really like my questions, but all the same gave some fast, entertaining, interesting and passionate answers about the natural world, which she has a deep knowledge of. I hope you enjoy it. So welcome to the Nature Magic podcast. Uh, you're very, very welcome. Where are we speaking to you from today? Well, I'm speaking to you from Kilrushen County, Clare. I've been living down here since last October. I, myself and my husband have rented an apartment on the main street. We're like students living above the shop. I have a son living down here and he got married all before Christmas. The, the wedding was delayed a few times with the way the COVID was. And now, so we thought we'd come down and escape from Dublin. And now it's the summer and it's great. So why, why wouldn't I be in County Clare? So there's nowhere like it. So we're only up the road in Kimbara. Well, I was up on the flaggy shores and I was up around the north of Clare whenever we were allowed to escape around our county again. So I've, you know, been up there quite a bit. I know, I know that part of the world well, yes. Yeah, and the flowers are out at the moment and the orchids. Have you been up to the barn? Ah, yeah, the orchids are lovely. And indeed, the other flowers are too, the gentians and the mountain avens and all of those other ones are splendid. Um, So how did it all start? We all have this curiosity and this interest in nature. So the question really should be, when did you lose your interest in nature rather than asking me, when did I get mine? I mean, we always had it. So I always had it. What can we do to get everybody who has lost that vision back uh, into seeing what's happening and looking after the planet well, I don't know what we can do. I've spent 40 years trying to do it. I wrote a book there recently called Our Wild World, and I had the notion that if people understood how the world worked in the first place, well, then they might be more inclined to do things to stop damaging it. Because, I mean, a lot of people um, aren't very clear on how the world works. They're not very clear on how the animals live. They're not very clear on what biodiversity is. And people are always saying, oh, biodiversity is a very big, hard word. Nobody knows what that means, which is rubbish. We know all the other big, hard words. We can know that one too. So this business of sort of saying the environment is something we have to react with or the environment is stopping us developing things or saving the environment stops me living as well off and as richly as I could. I mean, it's this idea of the us against the environment that gives us this whole approach. So, you know, this is a new thing. I mean, when I was young, me and Finn McCool, you know, we 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 lived in the world. We lived, we, we didn't pollute, we didn't throw things out, we didn't do all of those things because we understood living in a rural area that it was going to affect the area where we lived. But as people are more and more dependent on services to you know, take away their rubbish to provide them with stuff in supermarkets. They're very much removed from where these things are actually made and how they depend on the planet. And if you over, if you over actually take more than your share, then the, the world can't sustain this. So it's a really, and I think this this COVID um, epidemic, one of the things that has come out of it, in fact, is that people are more aware of their local surroundings and they're more aware of how much it impacts on them, particularly on their mental health. That if they're in a lovely area surrounded by nature, it's much more pleasant than if they're not. And for the area to be lovely, then it's up to the people who live there to keep it that way. No, no, I'm not advocating we should have pandemics, but it's certainly is is um which is like the silver lining if you might say on the on the situation yeah absolutely and even little things because you know the shops weren't open people were looking for things to make do and mend so and so there's been a lot more um upcycling using what you had and using your brains i mean all these big words i mean you know what do you have in the press what do you have what can you do what can you grow i mean call it upcycling if yeah. you like but you know we're not all out in bikes i mean you're just using what you have i mean you know like people do in other parts of the world i mean i've been to 
places like Africa where people are much, much, much poorer altogether. And I mean, they don't go to the shops ever sometimes because there aren't any nearby and they manage. So it's a matter of managing and thinking, you know, what can I do rather than rather than saying, oh, where can I buy it? How can I spend my wealth taking more of the world's resources? You know, so it's, you know, it's the least we can do. And we shouldn't be congratulated for it. We should be, you know, that's what we should be doing. Do you have a favourite plant or animal you would like to tell us? No, I don't. No, I mean, everything, everything in the world has a place. It all has a place. And if we don't have them there, that gap, that would be a gap. Even blue bottles. I mean, I don't love blue bottles. Indeed, I don't. But blue bottles are meant to be breaking down dead things in the hedge. People are always saying, you know, birds die. Where do they go? I mean, they're broken down and decomposed. They're part of, blue bottles are part of the decomposition cycle. So, I mean, we tend to anthropomorphize. We tend to say, oh, I like this because it looks lovely to our eyes. So I love something that looks gorgeous, like a lady bird but I hate something that looks horrible like a, a woodlouse I mean that's and nonsense so you can't be saying I like one and I don't like the other it's not up to us to like them you know I mean the more you learn about things the more interested you become in them so something that's whatever it is is fascinating when you understand what's going on so you know you can't be saying I, I like this one and I hate that one that's no way to describe the world in which we live at the moment in Kilrush, the swifts are all over the place. The swallows were there last night, as it was a very late night. It was the solstice. So, of course, I was interested in that. But then when I came down here in the wintertime, there was all of these um, geese here from, from Arctic Canada. And they were over the these spent geese were all over in the sea there at Al Vru. And, I mean, I was interested in those. So, I mean, you know, you can't say what you're interested in at the moment. I'm interested in whatever's happening at the moment. That's what I'm interested in, whatever I observe and see, because I'm a scientist and I notice things. Special moments, I suppose, is if you happen to actually be there when something happens, you know, when a butterfly opens its wings and you're trying to picture it and it's sitting there with its wings closed and then it opens its wings and you can see it. But but I don't get a deep spiritual satisfaction out of that. I just feel I'm lucky at the time to be there when something clicked. I do television things. We do television programs of stuff and you're out with your cameras trying to do things and nothing ever happens on film. I mean, these wildlife films that you see are a real swizz because what you're actually looking at is the results of maybe 10 hours of going around with the camera. You turn over a stone and there's all of these wonderful creatures all waving at you and eating and mating and dying. They are not. You've been setting this up for ages and you keep things in the fridge so they won't fly away. It's all contrived. So, like, I mean, we get the wrong image of what actually happens in nature by looking at stuff on the television. And I'm as guilty as anyone of that because I make these kind of programs. And we sort of, you know, a lot, a lot of time is spent waiting and watching and paying attention to things. But I suppose, I suppose one of the things that is very good if you want to be having a moment, as you say, is um, early in early in the year, around the month of April and May, when the sun rises and the dawn chorus happens. I mean, that's something that actually happens at a particular time. If you're there before it, it isn't there. If you're there afterwards, it's gone. So just at that particular time, at that time of the year, you get this, this dawn chorus, which can happen. And the I mean, if you're in a good place and there's lots of birds singing, well, it is very pleasant indeed, I have to say. I do like that. What positive action could you su suggest to people that they can do for nature? It should be positive towards the world around them rather than seeing it as the enemy. I mean, because, as you say, I, I am in the public eye a lot, you get questions and queries about things. And quite often they are, what is this? And what will it do to me? What is this and how can I get rid of it? I mean, this attitude that it's us against them, that's what people have to get rid of, that they have to work. We're, we're, we're an animal too. We're not in charge of the world. We're an animal on, in the world living in, in harmony or not in harmony with the creatures around us. And we have to realise that if we don't stop bullying, I suppose. I mean, bullying is a really, a really word, or oh, everything is bullied, everything is bullied. But I mean, we're bullying the oceans by throwing all that um, plastic into it, and the creatures that live there aren't getting a fair chance. We're bullying the environment by fly tipping and throwing things into hedges and ditches, because we can't be bothered getting rid of them. You know, so we have to have a fair crack at the whip and think, they deserve to live every bit as much as we do. Their habitats, their environments are every bit as important as ours. And if people do that, you don't have to join a society. You don't have to do anything. It's an attitude. And that attitude is something that must be, you know, really, really there because otherwise it's just laws and regulations and people say, well, no, if they're not looking, I can dump that over there. And if the camera isn't working, I can do this. And, you know, I mean, I... I, I I've succeeded in doing the terrible crime because I wasn't caught. I mean, that's the thing that's that's having the problem, really. You know, uh, I mean, it's the way you're brought up. It's the way it's the way you're 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 told 
as you grow up, how to treat things with respect. I mean, there's a whole Indian culture in India where, you know, other creatures that live have every bit as much of a right to exist as humans do. And that's part of the actual religion over there. So to have respect for something that that is there is is, is something that that we should have and we ignore it at our peril i mean what have we got now something like seven and a half thousand million people living in the world we haven't respected how other things live we've been too close to them and diseases that were on animals have jumped into humans and now we're all in a, in this quandary now with our with our um, COVID and COVID is only one of many I mean the, the, the um, what do they call it the Spanish flu way back in World War One. And that was actually a, um, a bird flu, the swine flu, there's Ebola, they're all of these things. So that it, we, we get what's coming to us if we don't respect nature, in fact. So it's it's even if there's no other good reason for it, it's for, except for our own self-preservation, we should realise that you can't trick with nature. I mean, the world is what, four and a half billion years old and there's been life on it for a very long time. We're only Johnny come lately. And we'll come lately and we'll go lately and the world will continue. So, you know, if we want to hang in there, we've got to live in harmony with the world we're in. I mean, it's looking at the, whatever it was today, the, the results from, from the EPA saying that we're greatly exceeding the amount of, air, of um, greenhouse gases we're putting up into the atmosphere, you know. And still, you know, we're still doing it and we're still exactly continuing to do so, hoping by some miracle we can buy our way out of it by buying other people's allowances. What are we like? Mm. It's an absolute joke. So how do we make change? I mean, what do we do? It seems so fruitless sometimes. Well, you can either burst the darkness or you can light the candle. I mean, I have spent all my life teaching people about it. I have written books. I have done my stint. You know, I mean, everybody can only do what they can. So there's no magic wand. I can't say this is what you do and the world is saved. I mean, I mm-hmm. can say that. But, you know, it, it won't work if people don't come along. So, like, it's 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 all a matter of, I mean, when I went to school in the 1960s, there was no environmental education at all. That hadn't been brought in come into the 1960s. When I went, did my leave insert, there was no biology on the leave insert. When I went to do science in UCD, you know, very few women actually had done science for leave insert in schools. It was a man's subject. So, I mean, things have all come on since then, and there's much more awareness in education than there was 50 years ago so that has to be good I mean you have to you have to see the brightness you can't be saying oh what are we going to do we can't do anything the world has gone to hell in a handicap so there's no point in even trying that's no way to be going on that's why I started the podcast really to give a positive voice for nature and try and engage people that weren't in that world trying to draw people in and create some kind of understanding Mm. But I mean, if you sow the seed, you never know where it'll, where it'll take root, you know. So all you can do is, as I say, light the candle and hope that the light mm. will spread. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well said. Well said. Um, do you have any inspiring nature books that you'd like to recommend to people? Because we have a little... Not the ones I wrote myself, of course. Why wouldn't I'll have I have all, all of those in the show notes for sure. I mean, the fabulous body of work. So definitely in the show. It's a one of your own particular that you'd like to talk about. Well, my latest one is called Our Wild World, and that actually yeah. addresses what we're talking about here today, mm. the impact humans are having on the world. And in the book, I explain how it all works. I don't say well, what you should do is not in so many words, but people are to draw their own conclusions from the way I outline it. And I do it in a a humorous way that you don't have to be a scientist it's not a whole heap of references it's not it's not an unreadable book in fact it's written for anybody from the age of nine to ninety and you know it's been used in primary schools secondary schools people are buying it or so they're telling me at any rate it's already gone into a second printing which is rather flattering i have to say so um those kind of things i mean books that actually inspire you but books Books are old fashioned. I wrote a book so I would be immortal because you can go on Google, you can go online, but computer can crash. You have to have the right stuff to play your videos and your DVDs. They'll be gone next. And be. But books, books are there since printing press. We still have the book of Kells written a thousand years ago. Wr- written word is what you want. So books are the thing, but people are less and less becoming interested in books. They think, oh, I can Google this and I can find out this. And the Google is written by other Egypts who are not necessarily peer reviewed. Anybody can put anything up on Google, apparently, and somebody else can read it and think it's true. I mean, that doesn't happen on, on things that are published. That doesn't happen on things that are reviewed and edited so yeah if you want to know the truth you're far more likely to find it in books so books is the business so any book that inspires you any book you can read that's the way to go is there a topic within your own book our wild world that you could uh, talk a little bit about 
there it is. It's called our wild world. Yeah. And yeah. it's from the birds and the bees to the boglands and the ice caps. And what I've actually done in the book is to actually um, write chapters on different things. So pollination, migration, hibernation, what omnivores do, why birds fly, biodiversity, where did we come from, bacteria, pandemics, things that go bump in the night, all of these things that that um, struck me. So it's kind of a, a series of essays in a way, rather than rather than actually, you know, a whole thing. The idea is here is how it works. Now it's up to you to cop on to think this is a good thing to be happening and stop damaging it. So that's that's kind of what I actually do. So, you know, we have a beautiful world and we humans are behaving in a beastly way to it. Understanding what is going on is vital for everyone. So the steps needed to sort this out can be taken and supported. It doesn't have to be a scientific, technical an explanation. A humorous, simple, scientific explanation does the job as well. We share our world. There are other ways of living and we do need to understand this. We're only one species, and yet so often the attitude to an unrecognized fellow species and sharer of our world is, what is this and how do I get rid of it? But, you know, it's not all about me, actually. It's all about us all. We are all in this together. So that's kind of what I start out with, you know, that the world exists in harmony with species that inhabit it. You know, and if the climate changes, well, then the world has gone out of harmony and we're causing these plenty of climate changes. So the world explains, the book explains how this, this actually happens. You know, what's wrong with having a septic tank? Nothing. But if you don't maintain it, you're polluting your neighbor's water. You know, what's wrong with what's wrong with doing or what's wrong with going in a car? Well, you're burning all this fossil fuel, which is cutting up into the air. You know, but if you have to travel from A to B, what can you do? And you can have an electric car, but then, you know, that costs so much. And where's the electric energy going to come from? Well, we can get sustainable energy from the wind. But then we have to look at wind farms and, oh, they're terrible and I don't want one outside my window. They're very good, but have them over there, have them somewhere else. You know, this idea of we can live in the world with a much lighter footprint, but we really have to want to do it. So hopefully this is what my book is about, to inspire people from the birds and the bees to our boglands and our ice caps. Oh, excellent. Well, I'll make sure that the book is in the show notes and on in our shop when we open up again. It was a pleasure to meet you, Mary. So thank you very much for talking to me and good luck with all of your future podcasts. News from the Barn Nature Sanctuary today is that the first of the slow cabins have arrived and they should all be installed in the next few days. We've been open and busy for the weekends in June and will be open for seven days a week in July and August. Please come and visit us. And if you'd like to talk to me about our conservation projects, be sure to ask.